So, to kick off, we're going to start with a panel, and I'm going to pass you over to Marianne Gazdik from Startup Grind to introduce the panelists. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, did we all have the morning coffee? Uh, double espresso? We're going to need it today. Okay, so uh, let's uh, jump right in. Uh, our guests uh, in this panel today are uh, ladies first, uh, Betty, Betty Mutimba. She is head of Startup in Africa. Uh, based in 25 cities in how many countries? 15 countries, uh, quite amazing, all around Africa. And we have Andrew. Uh, Andrew is one of the uh, guys who started Bakery, so you're the founder of Bakery, uh, which is doing now corporate innovation and connecting corporates and startups. And uh, today we spent the next 40 minutes talking about uh, how did landscape change between corporates and, and startups? Uh, and also, how did the fundraising change uh, over the last couple of uh, years? Let's start with you, Andrew. You've been around for a while. Uh, uh, when, I, when, I, when I came to London uh, three years ago, uh, our second ever event was at your space. Yeah. So we'll never forget that. Uh, how did you see the, the landscape changing over the years? So I think that... Um over the last four, Bakery was founded about four years ago, and it was a, a, a pretty simple idea. There was more and more corporates, particularly you know marketing people. We see a lot of marketing uh, innovation here today as well, uh, brand innovation. They were wanting to get more involved in innovation, but it was a, a, a bit of a struggle. They didn't really know how to do it. Um, you know, typical kind of thing that they do is they spend a lot of money on a big building, create a lab, or uh, you know, get involved with some kind of accelerator program or whatever it happened to be. Um, and uh, what we see now, I think, four years on, is a, 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 a real shift in the understanding that innovation's incredibly important, mission critical, in fact, um, that a lot of the methodologies that people have tried or attempted to, to use over the last sort of five or, five or six years haven't really driven terrific results. There's been, you know, some interesting, you know, campaign-y type things that have happened and, and, and people, you know, uh, but, but people are really struggling to get real, you know, driving innovation out of the experiments that they've, they've done. And I think there's a, as we were sort of just talking about before, there's a bigger and bigger pressure on these chief innovation officers or the people who run innovation within corporations to you know, do something positive and real with the funds that they have. Um, so there's a, um, th there's a real shift, I think, in, in driving specific results and not just taking risks and doing innovation for the sake of it, but actually getting something done. And I think that's what most corporates are looking yeah. to do now. So we know how not to do it. Uh, we know uh, they should not uh, buy a big building and refurbish it and then uh, realize they spend all the funds and there's no innovation. Uh, that's the wrong way. Uh, how do the corporates do it in Africa, Betty? Uh, well, in Africa as well, there's been a huge shift. Um, so three years ago, I started working on a startup and just then, it was a bit difficult to actually get access to these corporates, to um, get a meeting, to get taken seriously. But since um, they noticed that innovation is where they need to be and that their R&D teams aren't actually doing what they need to do, then now they become more accessible. They begin to partner with universities, they begin to partner with technology hubs, and they run programs. And what this does is it makes their funds available to startups. Um, it also helps them because they can <coughs> have these small startups um, creating innovations for them and the companies get paid. Um, the, the CIOs being more accessible, it makes them also um, become part of the ecosystem. Okay. Uh, how many of you have seen yesterday uh, the gentleman talking about his journey of winning the... Uh, Peter de Palace uh, from Africa, from Tanzania. Uh, have you seen that? Raise your hand if you have. Uh, it was quite amazing. He was talking about uh, applying for the pitch uh, at the palace, and he actually won. 
And right at the moment when the, the committee which was deciding on a grant he was supposed to be receiving, they uh, saw the announcement he won, so it was uh, helping him as well. Uh, uh, his product is a nanotechnology for purifying water, so it's, uh, there's lots of interesting innovation coming out of Africa, so well done for that. Uh, Andrew, you've seen corporates uh, starting and, and being hungry for innovation. Uh, how can you be successful as connecting them with the right startups? Uh, what is the secret sauce? So, well, oh, what's the secret sauce? Uh, so I think what we've learned is that, first of all, connecting with startups and, and actually getting real innovation done isn't easy. It's, it's, you, know, you have to have uh, a, a real process. You, have to, um, it's not, you can't just rely on serendipity. You can't just hang out in Silicon Valley and try and find startups that are going to make a difference for your corporate. And as a startup, you can't just you know, knock on the door and talk to the innovation officer and hope that something's going to happen. You, you have to really work at it. It's like most things, I think. Um, uh, you ha in order for it to be successful, you have to so have a real process. How, how do you do it? So what we do um, is, is, is we built a, a seven-stage process that starts with, first of all, understanding the real challenges and the problems that the corporates have. You know, it's very easy for a corporate to say, you know, we want to engage better with consumers or we want to, you know, build more sustainable products or whatever it happens to be. There are some key long-term goals. And sometimes the innovation guys, you know, have these three or four pillars that they're particularly interested in. But actually, when you get under the skin of the corporation, there are really specific innovation issues within divisions, within you know, the sales environment, or within the retail environment, or within the manufacturing uh, part of the company, that those heads of manufacturing, or heads of retail, or heads of sales, you know, don't realize that startup innovation like purifying water, or whatever it happens to be, could really fix. Uh, and so you have to get under the skin of, of the business to understand what the real problems are first. The other thing that we found is that you can't just do two or three innovations and think you've got an innovation strategy because likely not all of them will succeed or scale to a point where they're transformational enough for the corporate to make it you know, be of any use. You have to do 20, 50, 100 innovations, really small ones to try them, just like a, a startup would. Um, and then, you know, try, scale a little bit the 20 of those 100 that kind of make a difference, and the five of those 20 that are really transformational, you can, you can go big on. If you just do a little bit, you're really going to fail. You're setting yourself up for failure. How do you set um, up... Uh, yes, just please? to add to that, I think having that kind of process in place is really important. Um, what happens uh, back home, some companies, some startups are very wary of interacting with corporate companies, with banks and technology companies and telcos, because they get undercut. Um, sometimes you get uh, absorbed into the company and you develop a product that is good for them, but then they develop their own type of products and eventually they push you out. So being able to have a process like that where there's people who understand the corporates and people who understand the startups and can find ways to merge them together would actually be helpful. Uh, you know, I'm really interested you said that because I think that one of the mistakes that corporates tend to make is, you know, they'll, they'll put up a page of open innovation or, or whatever it happens to be. You know, we're the biggest manufacturer of food in the region. You know, we want to work with startups. We've got these challenges. Apply. Apply to us. Sign our terms and conditions, you know, whatever it happens to be. And they expect startups to come, you know, rushing. And, and it doesn't happen. Sometimes you, you will get the desperate ones, perhaps, or the ones that, you know... Are, but the guys that are building something really good, the guys that you really want to speak to, they're not going to look at your page and apply, you know, on, they, they have to be sold to, they have to be managed, like any kind of environment, they have to be brought in and almost convinced that it's a good idea to go and talk to one of those corporates, because you know what, they're building their technology and they, 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 they're good and they're going to succeed. So you need somebody in between, in our view, to help manage both sides of the relationship. How do you make sure you get the right startups to uh, connect with the right corporates? Uh, so, in, again, a, a lot of it is about understanding more about what the corporate op opportunity and, and challenge is. You know, sometimes 
uh, if you're working with a corporate, they'll be the particular challenge. You know, might be perfect for a relatively early stage company because the requirement that they have is not necessarily to scale internationally within the next six to twelve months. They're really interested in just experimenting, and so therefore, you know, somebody earlier on in their journey might be interesting. Other times, you know, this is a an absolute problem. They know it's uh, important. They need it to be an organization that has the capability to, to scale pretty quickly. And so then um, a slightly later stage company, somebody that's got the bandwidth uh, to cope with that kind of organization, you know, has to, has to be uh, in, in the mix. Otherwise, you're just not going to get a good result. Uh, fair enough. Uh, Betty, when it comes to industries, which industries are mostly uh, interested in, in corporate innovation in Africa? Uh, well, currently, we have um, the health industry. There's a lot of um, innovation that are coming around um, areas like mother's health and children's health, and there's a lot of room for them to interact with the corporate companies. Um, we have the finance industry um, with the new technologies that are coming up, um, cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of education that needs to be done with the banks and the Central Bank of Kenya, and there's a lot of interaction going there between the finance industry and the startups, and that's actually where we get a lot of money flowing in both directions, both corporate companies and the VCs getting involved. Um, and then there's the education industry in the entire continent, and I guess it's probably a global problem. There's a lot that can be done to disrupt the education industry. So there are a lot of technologies that are coming up on mobile um, and web that help, um, that help, you know, like, uh, propel the industry forward and are really making this uh, corporate companies like publishers, you know, getting like around for their money. Okay, you're mentioning disruption a few times. Andy, how scared are the corporates from this disruption? I mean, scared, it, it, you know, I'm not sure they're all quaking in their boots, but certainly it's a, it's a big consideration. You know, if you're a CEO of a, of a large corporation, in fact, I was in Latin America recently, met the CEO of a... Of a the largest car rental company in Latin America. And you know what, he's Did pretty- you rent one? Uh, I didn't rent one, as it happened, I used an Uber. So, I mean, that was, uh, you know, his concern There's is, you, an know, example right there, you know, right? I've got 120,000 vehicles that I own, um, you know, and, and more and more people are, are, are kind of renting, you know, Ubers or, 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 or taking other options for travel. How is that disrupting the car rental industry? Uh, and so there are a lot of sectors that, that, that really get that they're at the point of being disrupted. The other guys, pharmaceutical guys, uh, you know, FMCG companies, are worried, but you know, it's probably not knocking right on their door right now. I think they're, they're, most people, however, are concerned that, they, that there is disruption, and the smarter ones are thinking, well, I need to disrupt myself first before I get disrupted. Yeah. So it is two worlds. We have corporates on one side, they are comfortable, they, they're fine, they, they're kind of happy, they see the pressure, it's not big enough yet, and there are startups who are desperate to get some revenues, to get some business going. How do you connect these worlds and how do you bring them together? What's, what's the uh, unifying, how do you make a contract, making sure both are happy? So again, this is, you know, I mentioned earlier on, this isn't easy. You know, this is, most corporates don't know how to work with startups. Most uh, corporates don't understand the clock rate, the tick rate, the speed that startups work at. And most startups don't understand the challenges of working with large corporates. You know, things like inde insurance, indemnity insurance that they might need to have, or, or reading through uh, the, the terms and conditions that says, you know, by paying you this one pound, we own all of your trademarks for you know, throughout the universe forever, you know, or whatever it happens to be, which I've seen in some corporate contracts. Um, you know what? Um, th there is a, 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 a lot of effort that is required to bring these two worlds together. And if you just rely on serendipity, you'll ultimately be disapp disappointed on both sides. You know, um, there, there's a... There's a lot of opportunity for startups within the corporate environment. You know, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of interest, uh, there's a lot of reach, uh, there's a lot of consumers that they have access to, and, and so there's a huge amount of potential benefit. 
but there's also you know, a number of pitfalls. Um, so you have to make sure that the opportunity is right for, for both sides, otherwise it just doesn't work. Um, so you mentioned how the really good teams, really good startups who know they're building a good product um, wouldn't really come looking for the corporates. And also, you know, a situation like that, the startup would want to remain autonomous. Are there instances where you connect the corporates and the startup and the startups remain autonomous? Oh, in most cases, that's, that's what we try and achieve. There are some situations, some great situations, where a new piece of technology might be developed. And in fact, we've, we've done this with a very large management consultancy, one of the big top four management consultancies. We've introduced them to an artificial intelligence uh, solution. Um, and they've built a brand new piece of technology and they've now entered into a joint venture. So, you know, that's, that's a great example of how, you know, uh, great startup technology with the understanding and data that exists within a corporation can, can make a big difference. And now, you know, they're off selling it to, to joint customers. So it That's can work smart, really, yeah. really well. Yeah. Now let's, uh, uh, let's turn the page and talk about startups a little bit uh, from the startup perspective. So for startups, they, they want to make sure they get some funding going and they, can, uh, they get some revenues coming in because they, they, they need to pay for, for the bills. Uh, working with a big corporate could be uh, an alternative to raising funding. How do the startups you're working with uh, see that? And how did it change over the years uh, of working with corporates? So, again, when we started, we were very much like a sort of an accelerator model. We, we kind of stole the typical accelerator model, uh, which, you know, it's fine. Um, you know, we work with a corporate. If you get selected, you'll get revenue of, in fact, we said $50,000. A $50,000 uh, revenue contract was the prize. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so a lot of co startups started to see that revenue as an alternative to seed funding or, or whatever it happens to be. We've actually changed that now because now what we'll, we'll do is say, well, look, you know, that, that's a big risk, uh, even for a pretty large corporate, and not enough, you know, innovations were being done. So now what we, what we tend to do is work on what we call tiny little micro uh, trials, little uh, micro bits of revenue, um, uh, five, 10,000 pounds to test something in a, in a, in a short way. Um, the good news about that is, although it's not quite as much as 50,000, so you can't necessarily rely on it as a startup, um, it does um, allow you to prove your hypothesis, prove your, uh, validate your product, um, and get a little bit of revenue, which in and of itself allows you to potentially raise money. Because most um, investors these days, you know, will be looking at you getting some traction, proving, validating, and and we're doing that more and more, faster and faster for for more and more startups. In fact, a whole bunch of them are here today and we've done this for them. It's very smart to just do some minimal uh, vital products and see if it works and if it's if it does uh, move on if you uh, move move, uh, move further if it doesn't just change and do something else. But in fundraising in Africa uh, uh, do corporates uh, support working with startups or they prefer the accelerator model what, what an, uh, Andrew mentioned? Um, currently they mostly interact through accelerators uh, because even on their part, I guess it's hard for them to, um, to know how to trust the independent startups. Um, they're also interacting with different communities like Startup Guide and other entrepreneurship communities um, and using those connections to find ways to vet these startups and the startups as well um, through like a party that, they, that they're friendly with and they get to know that they can trust the corporates. Um, so there's still not like huge amounts of money going around. It's competitions where um, you win like $10,000 um, or $20,000, um, but it's a good way to begin and it really gets the startups um, on a pedestal. Seems like there are more bakeries needed in Africa. I think there's more bakeries needed everywhere. I but agree. I would say that, wouldn't I, I suppose. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that. So uh, you turning into uh, something bigger now, how do you scale uh, an operation like innovation, which is very hard? So, uh, you know, for me, I think, again, this, the, the thing that, the, that we found, you asked right at the beginning, well, what's the secret sauce? And I think, uh, I'm not s saying we've absolutely discovered it yet because we're still a startup. We're just, you know, only four years in. Um, but we've had some tremendous success. Um, and I think the thing that we're really realizing is it's this question of, of, of high volume, of, of um, 
increasing the rate of innovation, decreasing the cost per innovation, as, as we call it, so that you can actually do lots more um, and therefore get more out of the back end of the, of the funnel, if you like. Um, and if we can find ways to, um, to do that faster, more, with more corporates all around the world, uncover these challenges, and, and one of the biggest issues for corporates uh, when you get involved in that kind of process and strategy is uncovering the challenges within your, your business. The great news about that, if you can do it, is it spreads the culture of innovation throughout the organization. Uh, and, and actually, that's the big benefit of innovation, I, I, of, of this kind of particularly startup innovation. It turns the culture of the business from we can't do that, we've always done it this way, you know, we can't improve that, uh, to one of, let's see how we can do it. Maybe there's a way we can, you know, surely we can fix this. Uh, and because you start, work with, start working with more and more of these kind of amazing startups that are actually making amazing differences in all sorts of areas all around the world. Um, so if you can do that throughout your corporation, it can be completely transformational. Oh, uh, that's true. And for example, last year there was this uh, research done on how many uh, VCs have invested in the most uh, unicorns. And interestingly enough, uh, the most unicorns uh, was invested by uh, Salesforce, which is not a VC. Uh, let's talk about uh, corporates and investments. Uh, how do you guys see uh, big companies investing, who are not specialists investing. Uh, is it a good idea? Is it not? Uh, how, how do they do it? And how should they do it, in your, in your view? So, you know, there's, there's, there's two ways that they do it, in my view. M many corporates have venture arms. You know, Unilever have a, a big venture arm, Unilever Ventures, Coca-Cola, all these big companies. Um, and in my experience, they're great, but they invest just as investors. They're not necessarily the ticket to a startup to get a contract or an agreement or some revenue from Unilever or Coca-Cola. And so as a startup, if you go into a corporate venture, you should really, or a corporate venturing team, you should really be looking at it just like another VC. Uh, and if it, you happen to get some benefit, then great. But don't, you know, don't count on it. Um, so um, the big thing for me is the volume of um, money uh, that exists within corporations. There was uh, some research recently done um, that said that if you unlocked, if you could unlock some of the R and D budget uh, that exists, it's it's abs it's a, around the world. I think the statistic was just done in the United States. The R and D budget in the United States was four times the amount of VC capital that was available. So if you could just unlock a little bit of the R&D budgets in, you know, just American corporates, you know, and, and bring that into the, uh, the startup ecosystem, you can have a massive difference. And in fact, American corporates don't invest as much in R&D as many Asia-Pac corporates or Japanese companies or uh, uh, so on. So actually, I think the figure is, is much, much higher. Um, and if we could start to innovate within uh, corporates, in the sort of way that we've been talking about, in a much more productive way, then actually that would be a terrific circle of benefit that would really benefit um, the startup ecosystem, and I would suggest the whole world. You know, we just get better things. Betty? Um, I'll give an example of what's happening in Nairobi. So there's this uh, company that came up called Little. They are a huge rival to Uber in Nairobi. They're a ride-sharing service. And they partnered with Safaricom, who are the largest telco um, in Kenya. And so what they get is they get um, access through Safaricom's networks. Um, they get like to, to get the messaging um, all the way out to the masses. Um, they get to build on their platform, meaning that payments and stuff is streamlined. Um, and they really get to give then Uber a run for their money because they get support from this huge corporate company. Um, and they also get like a financial investment and eventually they do a revenue split. So if we have more partnerships like that, then it means um, in our context, our own technologies then can, can rise um, and our economies grow and um, we can you know, get to take up this on the global stage and compete with other different huge companies. Um, so I think there should be a lot more investment from the corporate companies 
I guess just more innovative ways to find them to interact um, and to like build a layer of trust. So innovative ways to get in. Andrew, in your experience, uh, if I have a startup and I would like to work with corporates, uh, what, what are some tips for you, uh, from you to me? How do I get in? Um, the first thing you really need to do is put yourself in the shoes of the corporate. L think about what it is that they're really trying to achieve. Learn about that particular company. Um, it no, it's really is no good having the best technology for a particular thing if that's not what the corporate is looking for at that moment in time. If that person that you're speaking to, you know, they might be interested in your technology in water pur purification with nanobots or whatever it happens to be, uh, but if that's not the thing that's top of their list, you know, you're just gonna come way, way down. Um, the other important thing is don't think, don't talk to them um, like you might talk to an investor. And that's a big common mistake that, that startups tend to make. They tend to talk about their team, what they've achieved, how much money they've raised, you know, the technology. That's a great point, <laughs> I agree. Um, uh, but what they really should be doing is, is talking about, first and foremost, how this platform or whatever it is that you've created can actually work for this corporate and help them sell more you know, bottles of water or help them raise their brand awareness or help them engender customer behavior that they want or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it's, it's really about thinking about it in, with the, and, and this is sales 101, right? So you know, you've got to think in your customer's shoes and put yourself in, in, in their world for a while and, and think about what they'd want and then present to them, pitch to them uh, in that way. Um, and I think that's the most important thing, that, tip that I could I give. I agree. Uh, uh, What's about the other way around? If a corporate wants to interact with a startup, how do they get access? So I would say that same is true the other way around. If, if you're a corporate and you want to find the very, very best startups uh, to work with, then what you've got to figure out is what is it that you are bringing to that relationship? Uh, and how can you um, can add value to that? It's no good just saying, we're big, you should be working with us. That just doesn't resonate with most CEOs of startups. You've got to say, look, you know, we've got this, uh, we really understand uh, the kind of things that you're looking to do. We're going to be startup friendly. Um, we can, you know, help bring you reach. We can help you achieve your goals. It's those kinds of things. Um, it's not just, and, and for most um, startup CEOs, founders these days, it's not just about money anymore. It's, it's, it's a lot more subtle. Um, and, and there are a lot more reasons that they're doing what they're doing. Um, so as a, as a corporate environment or a chief innovation officer within a corporate, think more about you know, what, what your company is bringing to that startup or the startup ecosystem. This is true. You know, I used to work for a corporate. I used to run marketing for Orange, for mobile broadband for, for Europe. And uh, I left in 2009, and it took me years to meet interesting startups. It's a different world. Uh, now it's much easier because conferences like this uh, is a place where these two worlds can meet. Betty, how does startup grind in Africa help uh, startups to meet corporates and vice versa? Um, well, so with Startup Grind, we host events every month for entrepreneurs. We bring in successful local founders, CEOs who share their stories, and the idea is to educate entrepreneurs in the room. Um, so currently we host this event in 25 cities in the continent um, and creating this community where, you know, entrepreneurs congregate every month and the communities have grown to numbers up to like 2,000 or something per city, then it becomes um, like a, a melting point where the corporate companies know they can come here to get access, they can come here to get visibility and being able to partner with us, then we're able to understand what they want and are able to communicate that to the startups who are interested. Um, so we will have you know, the typical events, the fireside chats, or we'll do um, customized events like a, a hackathon or a round table session. Um, we've worked with, in, for example, in Nairobi, we've worked with an investment company. Um, they have about like 50 companies in lots of different industries. So we've been doing round tables with them with like key entrepreneurs um, in the different industries to help them um, get new ideas, um, understand new ways of solving their problems, and this becomes a good channel for them to actually form um, relationships that last 
um, and create like the the proper channel for um, the kind of partnerships where they get funded or they get um, to build innovation for the company comes together. Okay, uh, that's interesting. Andy, uh, let's talk about the future. Where do you see it evolving? So now we know uh, it started with accelerators. Uh, we try to get to know each other. They uh, uh, they work together now. We have the, the founders factory, for example, and, and similar other models. How do you see this model of uh, big companies uh, not being killed at some point, but surviving? What, what, what do they need to do to, to survive and thrive? So, uh, you know, I think that they all need, to, will need at some point to have a multi-tiered strategy uh, to address all of the types of innovation that, that they require. And they, you know, the big challenge for corporates is, is how to keep up with the pace of innovation to, to, to try and stay ahead. Um, and uh, too, too many of them have relied on their traditional methods or, or protection of a big size or, or a, a particular pattern or a particular market. And they're now starting to recognize that, you know, that, that's just not enough anymore. Um, they need to continue to do innovation in their own way um, for, for things that they're amazing at. So, for example, if you're a drug company, you know, keep making great drugs, you know, and, and keep discovering new drugs. But also think about you know how you engage with you know the patients, how the patient-doctor relationship is changing, how data uh, is going to make a difference to your business. Because you know what Google and uh, and Facebook and Apple are collecting huge amounts of data on your patients, and if you don't innovate to keep pace with them, they you know they're going to steal a whole bunch of 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 your revenue. So everybody needs to start thinking about the different areas uh, of innovation all around uh, their business and have different strategies. And, and you know what? Investing in accelerators or in investing in uh, companies might be one key strand. Um, another key strand might be you know, making sure you're innovating just faster in the way that you've always done it. But the biggest bit, and for me, this is the, the big chunk, the 80% in the middle of innovation, is all the bits around your business that you should be innovating. Every single manager, every department head, every senior person within the organization should be given an innovation target and should be able to innovate in some smart, clever way around everything that they do. And if you could do that and achieve little bits of innovation all around your whole business, then you're starting to be a thought leader and you can um, and, uh, you can really see how that could transform your company. Yeah, wise words. Betty, where do you see the future of corporate innovation? Um, I think it'll get to a point where um, these corporate companies are not as um, you know, structured and compact as they are now. Um, I guess there's a role for structure, but there's also room for each of the different departments to to innovate, to be open to doing things differently and understanding new technologies um, and not just doing the norm. Um, I think it's going to be an exciting space where these corporate companies will be knocking down doors of startups or, you know, trying to learn startup methodologies, methodologies so that they can... Um, grow themselves in those kinds of ways. Okay, nice. And on this note, I hope you enjoyed uh, this talk. You've learned something. I did. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing your, your thoughts, uh, Andrew and Betty. Please join me in thanking Andrew and Betty. Thank you, Maria. <laughs>